Hey everybody, welcome to Do It Crippin' with Michael. Little impromptu podcast episode. I want to talk about NFTs. Yes. What the heck is an NFT? Honestly, I'm probably not the best person to explain it, but I will talk to you about why they're important because NFTs are insanely important for artists. And there's a lot of hate going on. Um, I've been warning people in the crypto space about the tipping point of dirty energy in terms of Bitcoin and also, I guess, Ethereum, because Ethereum uses a decent amount of proof of work, but they're you know focused on transitioning to proof of stake. And people just think like, oh, it's just left-wing liberals, blah, blah, blah. And I mentioned it before. I mentioned it with not so fast. A lot of people are moving their, you know, Roth IRAs, their this, their that, you know, their their investments into clean energy because they don't want to be, I mean, let's let's face reality. The world is warming at an alarming rate. And this whole thing of like, we can pretend it's not changing anything is utterly fucking ridiculous. If you think that you're going to be fine, you're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot. Because things happen quick. Um, I, I just don't know what to tell you. I mean... <laughs> There's so much data at this point of how drastically the Earth's warming. Like the last two years have been the hottest two years ever recorded in the history of, of mankind that we've been recording this stuff. So like 180 years, 120 years, whatever it is. Um, probably not 180 years, like 120 years. I don't know. I don't know how long they've been They've been measuring temperature. I don't, it may be 120 years or 180 years. I can't remember. But it's it's things are getting really, really bad. And people are like, oh, you know, human, humans don't have that kind of control over the, over the planet. It's like fucking morons. We burned a hole in the ozone layer because of CFCs. And the world decided to get rid of CFCs. And lo and behold, the hole in the ozone layer started to clear up. We used to have rivers catch on fire back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in major cities in the 1900s um, because they were so polluted humans did that we have people you know getting sick as hell in india because people are using rivers to you know wash their clothes and stuff because they don't have the infrastructure and that dirties the river and people get sick because they also use it for drinking and cooking so i mean People die in America from from toxic from water toxicity because power plants and plastic plant you know plastic producing companies are dumping all their toxicity into the river and it floats downstream. We are creating entire dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico because of nitro. I mean, I mentioned this with with not so fast le- last episode because of nitrogen in the fertilizer washes off the farm during the rains, goes into the river, goes down the river, and deposits in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's too much nitrogen now, and all these fish are dying because they don't get enough enough oxygen from the water. We had acid rain in the 80s in the Northeast because there was so much lead pollution. It created acid rain that was like destroying forests because there was acid in the rain. Like, this shit is real. We have control. I mean, there's that huge patch of plastic in the ocean that's like the size of Texas. Because plastic doesn't break down and it it all collects somewhere. So now all the fish are eating it because eventually it starts to eat, keeps on breaking down and breaking down and breaking down. And the fish don't know any different. They just see something small and floating by and they eat it. And then we start eating the fish. So like every single person on the planet, I don't know if every single person on the planet, but like the majority of people on the planet now have a lot of plastic inside them. You know, like, well, how much is a lot? Any amount of plastic inside you is a lot of plastic. So 
there is a tipping point that people are extremely conscious of trying to use less energy and trying to use more clean energy. And if you want to try to fight that narrative, you're an idiot. If you don't see how that narrative is going to go, you're just like the racist who thought that slavery would never end. You're just like the racist who thought that Jim Crow would never end. You're just like the racist who thought that they could keep you know, uh, um, black and white people from getting married. You're just like the bigot who wanted to stop uh, gay people from getting married. You're on the wrong side of history over and over and over and over and over again. And guess what? The good guys always win. It takes time, but in the end, the good guys always win. And if you think that the earth getting warm and, and burning all this coal and fossil fuel is good for the planet and good for humanity, newsflash, you're the bad guy. And you're going to lose. You're going to make a little bit of money up front, but eventually you're going to lose. And luckily we live in a civilized society because if we didn't, your head would be on a fucking pike. As history has shown us, people have a history of taking off people's heads who are assholes. And Hitler knew that. That's why he you know, put a bullet in his own head. Unless you think that he's living somewhere in Argentina, then I don't, I don't have any hope. For, then there's no hope for you. So, I mean, I don't mean to be like hyperbolic and, and, you know, over the top, but this is the reality. And if you don't want to accept reality, that's fine, but you're an idiot. And have fun staying poor, <laughs> as the idiot Bitcoiners like to say. So, you can't fight a narrative when it's based on fallacies. Bitcoin mining is not good for the environment. I don't care how dumb. I mean, I don't care what Anton said five years ago in his YouTube video. And it pains me to hear somebody so intelligent be so stupid sometimes. But Anton, if you think that cheap energy in a community is good for Bitcoin because then Bitcoiners come up come in and use all that excess energy, you th if you think that's good for that community that then has their electricity costs shoot through the roof because that's how the fucking free market works. Higher demand means higher prices. So when Bitcoiners come into a community and start using the energy to mine Bitcoin, guess what? The price of energy goes up and the people who aren't in Bitcoin who used to have affordable energy are fucking priced out. I don't know how you don't get this as somebody who came from a country that had a complete fucking like collapse. How do you not understand how normal people get affected by this stuff? Now, like, I don't mean to get all angry and pissed off, but, like, this stuff, you're hurting normal people trying just to survive. And Bitcoiners claim they, it's, you know, it's the, it's the, uh, the money for the people. Fuck that. Bitcoin actually hurts average people. Bitcoin is a plague for average people. And if you think it's good for, for, for average people, I say, fuck you, you're lying. And you're a fucking sociopath and you don't care about. Because nobody can be that stupid. Nobody can watch average people get hurt over and over and over again and then claim, oh, no, 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 no. This is good for them. What? Oh, you, so like being poor builds character? They should have just bought Bitcoin? Instead of that last can of beans or that top ramen to feed their fucking kids. So this is the narrative that people are coming across and smart people are hearing it. And they're looking at the facts. And guess what? They believe it because it's fucking true. And I hate to, I hate, I hate to say this, Bitcoiners, but you're going to lose. You're going to eventually lose. 
So I hope for your sake, you're one of those people that sells the top and is able to get out and be a millionaire and, and you know, buy your fucking private yacht or whatever you want to do to make up for your small penis or the fact that you didn't get laid in high school, whatever it is. All right. That was mean. <laughs> See what happens when I go on, when I go on a tirade. <laughs> I get mean. I don't want to be mean. I want to be nice. I want to be nice. Okay. That was my soapbox. Let's get back to NFTs. So NFTs, all that stuff people are hearing about NFTs, about burning fossil fuels, that's all true. We can't change that. But Ethereum can actually try to get ahead of it and say, we don't like this about Ethereum. That's why we're actively moving to proof of stake, which uses a lot less energy. And the reason I'm so passionate about this is because I'm an artist. And like 80 years ago, actors fought the, the, the studios. And, you know, people died. I don't know if you know anything about union busting, but it's not pretty you know like read about the pinkertons read about what's going on in georgia right now with is it alabama sorry i don't have my i have my computer on but i hate trying to do that kind of stuff when i trade i hate trying to google when i'm talking to you guys but amazon is doing everything they possibly can to try to stop that union from forming and they'll claim oh you know we we pay 15 dollars an hour and and, oh, no, people aren't really peeing in, in bottles. And then more and more people say, yeah, I actually pee in bottles. And then, you know, emails get released that, that say, uh, hey, can you tell your drivers to stop shitting in bags and bringing the bags back? Because, you know, drivers on a 10-hour 10 10 day or 8-hour day and they can't find a bathroom. So what are they supposed to do? Just hold their shit and pee in? No, that's how people, like, people fucking die from that. So they piss in a bottle. They shit in one of the carrier bags, right? That's that's what you have to do. I mean, this is what we also don't get about homeless people. It's like if someone's homeless and we don't have public bathrooms in Los Angeles or you don't have public public restrooms in your city, where do homeless people shit? Now, you can complain, oh, they're shitting on the street. Well, give them a fucking bathroom and they'll shit in a bathroom. Do you think they like shitting in the street do you think amazon truck drivers like shitting in the fucking back of the amazon truck no those are fucking carrier vans you could easily put a compostable toilet in there cost a couple grand five grand maybe i think for the compostable one i mean it would take like an extra six square feet or, or six feet you know whatever cubed cubed feet put a bathroom in the fucking van. <laughs> it, would make, it would make life so much easier for these drivers. Okay. But let's get back. Okay. <laughs> NFTs. 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 So the narrative isn't going to go away. So Ethereum people actually have an opportunity to jump ahead, jump ahead of the narrative. But because it's kind of a leaderless, rudderless ship, you know, and, and you know, I love. Uh, I don't know if we really want Unicorn Boy to be the face of Ethereum to the whole world. I think he's great, but other people, I don't know. I mean, maybe people want to, I think when we're dealing with lots of money, people feel comfortable with a suit and tie because they went the, the hoodie route with Facebook and it turned out pretty fucking disastrous. So maybe you don't need a suit and tie. But you need somebody who's not a sociopath. Because, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, actual, I'm not going to say actual, I don't know for a fact. But he kind of seems like a fucking sociopath. It's like, dude, I don't know why you think, okay, NFTs, (laughs) back to NFTs. Okay, so. Why are they why are they so good for for artists? Okay, so actors they fought against the studios and they got something in their contracts in their union. It's not a union, it's a guild. SAG Screen Actors Guild. 
they got something called residuals put in. So if you ever do a union job, every single time that product airs, the commercial or the show or the movie, the actor actually gets a small little chunk of the of the profits. Because what happens is, let's say it's Paramount. Paramount airs a, sh- airs a movie on, on NBC. Well, NBC actually pays Paramount for the rights to air that movie. And actors were like, hmm why are you getting 100% of the money? We did all the work. They're not, they're not signing up to watch a Paramount movie. They're signing up to watch a Tom Cruise movie or a whoever movie, Bugs Bunny movie, not Bugs Bunny, but like, yeah, but voiceover, whoever the voice is for Bugs Bunny. Like they're, they're, they're signing up to watch that. They're not signing up to watch, oh, oh, there's a new Paramount movie. Let's go, let's go, let's go to the movie theater and pay $20 to see the next Paramount movie. Nobody gives a fuck who the fucking studio is. They care about the people on the screen. They care about the actors. Sometimes they care about the director. Sometimes they care about the screenwriter. Sometimes they care, you know, they care about the artists who make this movie. Studios don't make movies. Studios pay for artists to make movies. Now, I'm all for the person who foots the bill to allow it to get made to take a sizable percentage of that. Like, because, you know, if, if I'm going to invest $100 million into a movie, I want to make sure I'm going to make at least $200 million back. I want to double my money or else this is not worth it because the risk is so high of the movie being a failure and not making that money back. The movie business is not like, I mean, it's not really a profitable business. It is for a few players who have figured out how to game the system. But like the, for the average person, it's not a profitable business. So actors fought and they fought hard and they said, you're using my face. You're selling these movies with my face on it. People are watching it and paying for it and buying tickets for it because of my face. We want that cut. So actors get it. Actors got it. They fought hard for it. And actors go on strike. Writers go on strike. Writers are on strike right now. I mean, I'm not sure if uh, the 100% it's over, but for the last year, they've been on strike. They fired all their agents because agents were working with production companies. Agents were actually becoming production companies and then lowballing writers and taking all the profits for themselves. Total conflict of interest. They weren't because they were the, they were the production company and the agent for the writer they weren't fighting for higher wages for the writer because they were also the production company. So they wanted to pay the writers less and they'd rather make more money on the back end with the sales than on the front end of getting that commission for the writer. So these are the things that artists deal with on a daily basis. Oh, you're a photographer. Okay, great. Unless you actually print out an image and maybe say print 100 and label it one of a hundred Anybody can just right-click your image. Anybody. Oh, you're a digital artist? Cool. I've already stolen every single one of people's works on my hard drive. Like, it's so easy to do that. And Beeple has no recourse. And he made zero dollars. And then I could turn around and say, sell it to somebody or like, or print it out. And say, hey, here's a people print. And someone says, like, well, is it legitimate? Who fucking cares? It's like the Mona Lisa. I'm going to print it out and hang it on the wall. But people do care about that kind of stuff. People do want to know that they're buying an original. People do want to know that they're getting, that they're actually supporting an artist. So what happened over time is people would see an artist who'd be, who they thought was going to be hot, they'd buy up all their work for, for pennies on the dollar. And the artist, who's just half, at this point happy to like sell something, has somebody buy like 
all of their work. They'll walk into a showcase and buy all their work until they'll buy like, they'll buy like every single piece for $1,000. And then they'll turn around and start promoting this artist and then turn around and sell their work to somebody else for a million dollars. And that artist made that $1,000 and that's it. And they never make another dime again. And then the person will take it to Christie's and sell it for $60 million. And then three years later, the person who bought it for $60 million will come back and sell it for $100 million. And then the person who bought it for $100 million, five years later, will come back and bring it back, sell it for $120 million. All the while, this artist who did all the work sold it for $1,000 and is never going to get another dollar again. And people say, well, you know, it helps, it helps the artist. Their fame. Well, what if they get in a car accident and can never create art again? They sold those original $1,000. You know, they sold, they made $20,000 from, from being an artist. And because they're in an accident now, they can never make another dollar from being an artist. Or what if they just don't have any inspiration at that point? It's happened. Like we've heard of it. We have a we have a phrase call it for it. One hit wonder. You never hear from that artist again. But the great thing about music is they have something called royalties. So every time it plays on the radio, every time it plays on Spotify, every time it plays on Apple Music, every time it somebody buys the LP, the record, the CD, whatever, the eight track, the artist makes a royalty from that. And there's jokes around about artists who live their entire lives rich because they sold one song. Now you can say, well, that's, you know, bullshit, blah, blah. Nobody should be able to get rich from one song. Well, it's because nobody knows what an artist goes through to produce that one song. They can work years and years and decades, you know, playing those shitty clubs or whatever, just never, ever getting a chance. And then all of a sudden, they have a moment of clarity and they write a song that the entire world connects with. One person creates a piece of art that every single person on the planet comes into contact with. Now tell me, look at yourself in the mirror. What have you produced that every single person on the planet is going to come into contact with. And up until that point, the person was living in a fucking double wide trailer, eating top ramen, not sure they're how, how they're going to eat every day. And we hear about the stories all the time. Just actors like on their last, on their last dime, just get that one final audition. They're like, I'm going to quit if I don't get this because I can't afford it. I can't pay rent this month, whatever. And they book it. And then all of a sudden, Matt LeBlanc was like that. You know, he was working at Fat Burger, barely able to pay rent. And he books friends. And it's just like, that's what the life of an artist is. Especially in America, where nobody respects artists. I'm not going to say nobody, that's hyperbolic. Act, I mean, artists are not respected in this country. I mean, Republicans do everything they possibly can to deny the government aid and support artists in any way. I mean, little Nas X just put out some sneakers, some uh, Nikes with a satanic symbol and one drop of blood <laughs> encapsulated in the satanic symbol. And Republicans are freaking the fuck out. And I'm sure he did it just to fuck with them. And it worked because they're all losing their shit and they're going to drive up the price of those sneakers 1,000x just because they're making so much hay out of it. But what Little Nas doesn't understand is that's going to that's gonna be the impetus for them to cut funding to the, the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts. And they're going to use that and they're going to hold that up and say, see, we don't want your taxpayer dollars to go to fund satanic artwork. And it's going to work. 
So the NEA is going to have 20% of their budget cut. In England, you can be an artist and get unemployment for being an artist. That's your full-time job because people in England realize that living on $15,000 a year is a life that nobody would choose to do, choose to have because it's a shitty life. I mean, I don't want to get a so- on a soapbox or anything, but like, look, I'm mid 40s and I'm a good looking guy and I'm in shape and I got a great smile and I got, you know, I'm, I'm personable and sense of humor and people are like, why are you fucking single? Well, LA is a pretty uh, vapid city, you know, lots of Botox. Lots of nips and tucks here. Lots of Mercedes. Lots of BMWs. Lots of Land Cru- Land Rovers. You walk into a date, and the woman's like, "Oh, what do you do for a living?" Uh, I'm, a bar- I'm a bartender. And eh. strike one. Do you have any hobbies? Uh, well, I'm into cryptocurrency. Eh. Bye. <laughs> like. Most people in crypto are poor, right? Most women are looking for a little bit of security. And it's okay. I've, I've made my peace with it. I've come to accept that. Like, But this is the reality of like artists, we don't choose this because we want to be fucking poor. Like I have friends who, who have found somebody, but they usually find other artists and they're moving every six months because rents in LA just keep going up. So they have to move every six months or every year and they struggle and they work three jobs each and they barely get time to see each other. And they, but they, you know, they figure out how to be happy somehow and it's fucking tough because being an artist is, is like a curse because people who really want to be an artist, not, be famous but actually be an artist want to create stuff that inspire people to be better that want to inspire people to change the world to stand up and say hey that's wrong let's fix that there's a reason why artists are usually the first people killed when a dictator takes power because artists inspire people to fight back artists are some of the most dangerous things to an authoritarian regime. So maybe that's a good indicator of why American government is so aggressive towards artists. Maybe we are an authoritarian regime. I mean, we fucking sure as hell were to black people and the Chinese people and the Japanese people and to the Mexicans and then the Arabs. I mean, go down the list. If you're not white, America's fucked you over in some way at some point. So there's a reason why artists get taken down. And you go to civilized countries, because America sure as fuck is not a civilized country. You go to civilized countries, Northern Europe, Central Europe, Southern Europe, Western Europe, lots of countries in Asia, Australia, New Zealand, lots of countries in South America. I don't know South America as much. But they say, look, you want to be an artist? Fine. We know it's a shitty life. But we know that what you do is important. Right? I mean, like, Raise your hand if you didn't watch a movie during COVID. Raise your hand if you didn't watch a TV show during COVID or listen to music during COVID. I mean, artists single-handedly saved millions of lives over the last year of people who were stuck in their homes bored out of their mind, losing their sanity, depressed. 
people turn to art. They turn to music. They turn to movies. They turn to comedy. They turn to they they want to laugh. They want to escape these horrible feelings. There's a reason I didn't see Boys Don't Cry for so long. Because when I watch TV or when I watch a movie, I want to I want to feel good. And when life is shitty, I don't want to watch something that's going to make me feel shitty. Even though it's a really important movie to watch, it took me 10 years to watch that movie because I knew it was going to be heavy and I had to like emotionally prepare to watch that. So being an artist is fucking hard. This idea of 8% of people at any given time in Los Angeles can support themselves by it from acting. 8%, 8% of actors. That means the majority of actors have to work some shitty job. And people are like, oh, just go get a 9-to-5 job. You can't get a 9-to-5 job. All the auditions are during the day. So unless you have a job that lets you leave whenever you want and just go off for two hours, you can't have a 9-to-5 job. So I'm working an on-call bartending job. And I make decent money, but it's on-call. So someone, so I'm dating somebody they're like, hey, you want to go away in a month? Uh, I, I don't know if I can. Well, can you just plan? No, I, I can't. Because they could call me two days before and say this is a $2,000 job. Google had a party at my hotel. In one day, I made nineteen hundred dollars. So I made my, I paid my rent and all my bills in one day, and that I didn't work, and that I didn't work for three weeks, because there just wasn't any work. And people were like, "I'll get a second job." I can't get a second job because my second job is gonna maybe make like a hundred or two hundred bucks a night. And if I'm working for that other job, and so, and they say, "Hey, can you come work at this hotel job?" I can't just get up and leave because, you know, usually you go to a bar and it's one person. I mean, talk to all these people during COVID who are working as Amazon food, uh, whatever it is, where, you know, the, you, you order food from Amazon and they, you know, they deliver your groceries. I'm blanking on the word for it. It's a fucking shitty job. But people do what they have to do. I mean, so artists do what they have to do. Imagine, it's just like, it's so hard to imagine it if you've never had to, if you've never had to do it. It's hard to imagine being poor if you've never been hungry. So this is what it's like to be an artist. And this is how, it's, this is how hard it is to be an actor, where we actually get residuals. If we do something. So I've worked more than like 90% of actors in the world. And I've still only made like $60,000 in my entire life. I've been acting for over 20 years. I booked my first paying job when I was 20. So for 25 years, I've been, I've been a paid actor. And I've never made enough to actually survive in an entire year from my from my pay. So it's a brutal job. People are like, well, why don't you quit? Eh, you know what? It's just like, I've tried. I've tried the office job. I've tried working in the oil fields. I've, you know, I've tried everything. Not everything. Hyperbolic. Don't be hyperbolic. I've tried a lot of stuff. And I keep going, like, this is what, I read this great article. It wasn't an article. It was just like a fucking 30-word blog or whatever. And it said, stop trying to be good at stuff you're not good at. Focus on being better at what you're already good at. And it's, you know, maybe it's that whole like master or jack of all trades, master of none. And maybe it's good and... and People don't know the rest of that quote. The rest of that quote is it's actually better to be a jack of all trades than a master of one because 
being a master of one is like a shitty life because it's like this it's like a siren song you can't get it out of your head and you try to do I you know I try to do anything else and I like I worked in an office job for 6 months and I wanted to jump out the window every fucking day I've never been so depressed in my entire life and it's just like it sucked the life out of me and I'd much rather live day to day bartending wondering how I'm going to pay my bills every month and have a little bit of creativity in my life just that small spark of creativity in my life can keep me going and that's as an actor who gets residuals if I book a job So now think of photographers or digital artists like Beeple. I told somebody about Beeple and I said, oh, it's, it's this project. It was a 500, you know, he did it for 5,000 days straight. And the person looked at me and goes, why the fuck would somebody do that? And I just thought to myself, I was like, wow, that person obviously isn't an artist and doesn't have anything that they're passionate about in life. Because when you're passionate about something, you don't have a choice. It's this thing inside you that just like pushes you and pushes you and pushes you. You can't get it out of your head. You can't stop thinking about it. And also, that's how people get good at stuff is by doing it every single day. And what I loved about that 5,000 day um, image he sold was I got to zoom in and see just how bad of an artist he was in the beginning. He was not good. But he was good enough. And he obviously had passion and desire and a drive to keep going. And he did. And raise your hand if you can think of something that you've done every single day for 5,000 straight days. Is it 5,000? Shit. I'm going to be embarrassed if it's like 300. <laughs> but I think it's like 5,000, like 10 years or something like that, right? So raise your hand if you've done something for 5,000 days. What is it like? That's 12 years or something like that, 13 years. Anything. It's hard. There's always something. There's always some reason not to do it. Family or you're sick or your friends want you to go somewhere or whatever. There's always some reason not to do it. But being an artist is about having to push all that aside sometimes. You got to push away friends. You got to push away family. You got to push away dates and girlfriends and boyfriends and husbands and whatever like you got it that's the thing about creatives is when we don't do that we start to get depressed like i said it's a shitty fucking life i would much rather be happy delivering the mail and having some consistency in my life and be able to take vacations and be able to plan a year ahead of time to take a vacation Like, I mean, if I was a working actor, being able to support myself from acting, I, it, it's very difficult because you'll see actors who they'll work like six straight movies in a row. And you're like, holy shit, that person's on fire. And then all of a sudden you won't see them for three years. It's because they weren't hot anymore. They weren't the hot actor that had to be, that, you know, directors wanted to work with. They fell out of favor. They had... One movie flop and then another movie flop and then people are like, oh, I don't want to touch that person. That person's, you know, they're obviously doing something that's making movies flop. Which is, you know, ridiculous. But that's how other artists are. Sometimes they can, it's scary to work with somebody who isn't selling tickets. And, and studios are like, that. you know, that person doesn't sell any tickets. 
don't hire that person anymore. Then all of a sudden, somebody disappears for 10 years, 5, 10 years. And thank God they get some residuals because what are they going to do after being a, a fucking movie star? They're going to go work at McDonald's? Did you hear about what's his name at Trader Joe's? He was the boyfriend in in um, the Cosby show. I think it was like Lisa Monet's boyfriend or whatever. I don't know if it was her or the other sister. He works at Trader Joe. Trader Joe's in LA. And people were making fun of him on Instagram, on Twitter and all that. They were writing articles like, what a fucking loser. Look at how, like, like oh my God, look at like, the, you know, the stars falling or whatever. And he's like, I got to pay my fucking rent or I got to pay my mortgage. I got, fa- I have a family. I like, I'm not ashamed to work at Trader Joe, at Trader Joe's, but he got ridiculed on a daily basis by people as like some kind of failure in life. Like this is how people treat artists in this country. It's fucking embarrassing. That they would treat human beings that way. Ridicule somebody for the job they have. Just because it's different than the job they used to have. So this is what we go through as artists. So when I see somebody like Beeple sell a piece of artwork for $69 million worth of ETH, and then he sells all his ETH. I'm like, fuck yeah, bro. Good for you. 5,000 days of slaving away and not selling shit. Then all of a sudden your star rises and people want to buy your shit. Do it. Make your money. Because this country does not give a fuck about you. And as soon as your star falls, they don't give a shit if you're working at fucking McDonald's. They don't care if you can't eat. They're going to laugh at you about what a failure you became. So it's your responsibility to make sure you can support your family in 10 years. So do I think he should have kept his ETH? Fuck no. You know, maybe a few grand. But like, bro, go buy a fucking jet. Like, live your life. Do your thing. I don't fucking care. I would love for that jet to be (laughs) eco-friendly, but like. (laughs) So the reason I like NFTs, and I don't think most people understand this, is that when I create an NFT, I can change the smart contract. And it says, what percentage of the sale would you like it going in the future? You know, you just click 10% or 15%. That means like every single time somebody wants to sell your work that they bought, the artist gets 10% of it, 10% of the sale every single time in perpetuity forever. So all these rich assholes wash trading your artwork back and forth. You know, selling it for 100 million here, 100 million there, 10 million, whatever, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, passing it around. That artist gets 10% every fucking time. And it's not 10% off the top, on top. It's just 100% minus 10%. The person who sold it gets 90%. So the person buying it isn't paying an extra 10% on top. They're just paying the quoted price. And the smart contract offers this. And some asshole who obviously hates artists, I don't know why, probably because our country teaches people to look down on artists, said, well, you know, the person could just easily make an agreement with the, with the buyer and just say, Hey, I'm going to send you some Bitcoin. Send me the paint, you know, send me the art and bypass the smart contract. So the artist wouldn't get their cut. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'm going to reach out to a person and say, Hey, send me a hundred million dollars of Bitcoin. I promise you I'll sell you. I'll send you over the people afterwards, after, after the Bitcoin clears. 
just like the fucking idiocy of people. It's like that person probably bought a bridge or bought some ice for mesco. I mean, what that's 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 a bad bad analogy. I don't know if you know in the past artists have consistently in this country been treated like shit and and pretty much everywhere at certain points. Like when they would tour the country doing shows they would have a wall in the middle of the of the dining room and artists and black people and you know all the dregs of the dregs were were on one side and all the people of class and sub and substance were on the other side and artists were put on the side of the slaves or the servants and looked down upon even though people People were paying exorbitant fees to go watch them. You could watch them and you could be entertained by them, but you couldn't mingle with them because they were low class. So this is what artists have dealt with for hundreds of years in this country. So when we say we want a cut of every sale, that's a fuck you to people who have been taking advantage and commodifying our hard work, our blood, our sweat, our tears for hundreds of years. Giving us none of it. None of the profits for the work that we created. Unless we fought tooth and nail for it. And this is why NFTs are so fucking amazing. You want to right click my work? Have at it. I can't stop you. I actually want you to right click my work. I want you to right click every single pre- every single digital piece of artwork that I have out there. I want you to fall so in love with my work that you want to right click every single one and print them on your walls. Because then at some point, you're going to want to buy it. And then you're going to want to tell your friends and your friends are going to see it hanging on your wall. And then maybe one day I'll be able to support myself and not have to bartend anymore. And that'll be a great fucking feeling, man. That'll be a great feeling. So let's focus on getting NFTs on layer two solutions, on side chains. I know they're, they're, they're getting there. I know BopenSea and Whale Crate are on BSC. And I know there's one, I think like Chi dot something or I forget the name of it, like Particle or something like that is going up on XDAI. So I know, and I know like, uh, what's it called? Avagache, Sunmatic, Polygon. So it's getting there. But we really need Super Rare and OpenSea and Rarible and Mintable and all these ones. We really need them to get on side chains because trying to create a collection, just to, just to create the compartment for me to upload my photography because I was a photographer and a filmmaker in undergrad. That's what I started off. That's what kind of like got me into acting. Just to create the container is $500. So when I have to pay one third of my rent, just to create a container plus you know 60 to 100 dollars for every single photo i upload to put inside that container it's creating a barrier of entry that only rich artists are able to get into and the last thing i want as a fan of cryptocurrency 
is for cryptocurrency to have barriers of entry for poor people. Because in my mind, that's the antithesis of what cryptocurrency is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be something for everybody, no matter how rich or how poor you are. It's supposed to be, in my mind, the great equalizer. The thing that'll let the person living in a hut in Zimbabwe participate in the world the way I get to. The way Elon Musk gets to. That's what I envision when I think of crypt cryptocurrency. I envision it as the great equalizer. So that's why I want NFTs to be successful. Because I want that person, you know, making $2 a day in Mozambique who's an amazing artist to be able to put their work on the blockchain for, for pennies on the dollar and then start making a percentage of every single time their artwork is sold between people and help lift that person out of poverty the way I want to be lifted out of poverty through my own work, through my own creativity, through what I give to the world. There's nothing more inspiring for an artist to feel like people are being inspired by our work. And it shouldn't be just rich artists that get to feel that way. So, Get the word out there. NFTs are good for artists. And the only people who don't really want it to work are the people who most likely take advantage of artists and are profiting off of their hard work and don't want artists to rise above that. Because if, if artists are able to do it themselves, there's going to be a lot of people who make their living exploiting artists. And they're not going to be able to do that anymore. And those people are fucking terrified because they realize they don't offer anything to the world outside of exploiting another person. And all of a sudden that mirror is held up to them and they have to look themselves in the face and realize they're not good people. And that fucking terrifies them. So... You know, get the word out, help artists, support artists. You know, if you can't afford art, I don't care if you pirate it. I don't care if you right-click it. But if you right-click something, if you download something, quote-unquote, illegally, and you like it, share it with the world. Get it out there. Talk about it. Let the artist know. Tweet them. Tweet at them. Hey, I saw your work. Don't tell them you stole it. You don't have to. They're not going to ask you, did you pay for a ticket? They're not going to. They just, they just, they want to know that they've inspired somebody. It's such a good feeling when someone says, hey, I saw you. You were so great. I loved it. I laughed out loud. It's such an amazing feeling. You know, tell the person you love that you love them. Tell them why you love them. It doesn't have to just be with artists. It can be with everybody. Just, you know, be supportive of people. So steal, steal art. I don't care. But do what you can. If you're going to steal the art, do what you can to help that artist eventually get paid for their art. If you like the work, spread it out there. Tweet, retweet, shout it from the rooftops. This person's amazing. Help them get paid. Somebody will have money. Somebody's going to hear you and then pay for that artwork. And that artist is going to be thankful. Just don't tell them you stole it, you know. Okay. That was a very pausey episode sorry about that it's just 
it's a very personal um it's a very personal it's just a very personal thing for me and i i keep seeing people on twitter like bashing nfts and saying nfts are horrible and this and that nfts aren't horrible nfts are amazing and once we get all the kinks worked out you know once we get it so they're not on centralized servers on the blockchain and if that centralized server goes down well the digital key is there but the artwork's gone so once we get stuff like that taken care of you know this is the very early early stages i don't mind that stuff because i understand that's just like we got to work out the kinks we got to figure out like this is just how technology works this is how art works we got to learn the hard way what works and what doesn't work what the pitfalls are we grow we evolve so like let's be patient and let's let people know hey we're aware of this issue we're working to fix it but this is the reason why nfts are so important and once we fix these things nfts are going to be great for artists and remind them say how many movies did you watch last year how many tv shows did you watch last year how much music did you listen to last year how many pictures did you see that inspired you how many sunsets how many like whatever how many portraits did you see this is important art is nourishment for the soul it inspires us it 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 brings us joy and not a lot of people have a lot of joy in their life right now and the funny thing is is despite being treated like shit and not making any money a ton of people still do it and try to do it for a living. And after 30 or 40 years, they're still plugging away, just trying to pay their rent every month. Because they'd much rather do that, you know, than work as a post office person or, or a truck driver or whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with those things. Like I said, I'd much rather be able to do those things and not go stir crazy. But some of us just aren't, we're not physically built for that. And I think people just need to respect that we're not all the same. We don't all think the same or feel the same or respond the same to stuff. So just, you know, do some research about your favorite art artist or your favorite actor or your favorite musician and see and see the work they've put in. I mean, the Beeple, the Beeple style work of like 5,000 images for 5,000 straight days. It is getting better and better and better and better. I mean, when was the first time Beeple sold something? I don't know. I didn't do any research on that. I just started talking about them. So, I mean, but like most artists don't get paid for the first few years of being an artist because they're busy learning the craft and getting better and doing it. So a lot of this stuff are like, so perfect example. And then I'll, and then I'll end it is I was a photographer in New York. I was doing, I was, you know, building a fashion portfolio and to be able to do that, I had to spend about $7,000 cause this is back before digital camera. So I, I, I bought a medium format camera Luckily, I lived in a really big two-bedroom apartment and my roommate didn't care, so I pretty much turned the living room into a studio. I had to buy lights, you know, special strobes for photography, bounce cards, umbrellas. Shit's expensive, man. And then you got to, in the beginning, you got to try to find a makeup artist who is willing to work for free to help to build their portfolio. And if not, you got to pay a makeup artist. And a hairstylist and a clothing designer because models aren't naked. They got to wear something. So you got to find somebody who's designing clothes who wants to let you use their stuff for free. Or you have to pay somebody, to, a stylist, to, to do that. It's like, this is, exp you have to, like, photographers put in a ton of work just to, and, and money just to build a portfolio that they can then send around to people and try to get paid work from that. 
the iPhone and Instagram is like the worst thing that happened to photographers in the world. That was just as I was like coming into the ability to get paid and that started to happen. My friend's husband was a full-time photographer and he was making about $300,000 a year and from one year to the next, he went from 300000 to 30000 a year as a photographer. Because everyone's like, oh, why, why would we pay somebody? Just get an iPhone and do it ourselves. Well, yeah, but your work looks like shit. And that's the bane of every photographer's life is now the majority of the stuff out there is absolute garbage. For people who have no idea what they're doing, no experience, they're just willing to work for free. Great. So the, those of us who had like, so I, I sold everything when I moved to LA. I sold like $8,000 worth of photography gear for $800. Because it was worthless at that point. So this is the kind of stuff like we deal with as, as, as artists on a daily basis. So support an artist. You know, that musician singing on the street corner. Throw them a dollar. Say good job. You know, whatever. Pirate that movie and then tell everybody about it if you liked it. Right-click some of people's work. You know, keep the, keep the dream alive. Tell people about it. It's like, do whatever you can. Just help help artists. Pay your fucking taxes. Call your congressperson and say you want the NEA to have a, have a bigger budget. And that helps people who just want enough to pay to survive. You know, there's not a lot of artists who are driving Lamborghinis. Maybe 1% or Mercedes. Maybe 10%. The rest of us drive Priuses or Honda Accords or Civics or like, you know, shitty cars. Not that, you know. Not that they're shitty, but not flashy cars because we're not millionaires and we don't, we don't care about that. Sure. Everybody would like to be a millionaire, but like, I'd rather just be able to pay my rent every month and be able to be an artist. If someone said you can be a millionaire and never make art again, or get to be an artist full time and never have to worry about paying your rent, always having enough just, just to pay your rent, but that's all you get. I would absolutely just pay my rent. And be an artist. I don't care about being a millionaire if it means I get to be an artist. So, a lot of people are like me. A lot of artists are like me. You got to realize that. We're not, we're not in it for the money. The money is just a nice byproduct. But a lot of times that byproduct it comes with a lot of toxicity. And that's why a lot of successful artists end up killing themselves or dying. A lot. You know, drug overdoses. They can't handle that kind of pressure. So, all right, my voice is getting hoarse. I talk too much. Okay. Well, thanks for listening. If you got through all that, (laughs) that was a little bit of a soapbox. Um, But it's been bugging me seeing it on Twitter. So, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting. Been getting a little couple nano tips here and there um got a patreon supporter you know it 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 means a lot it means a lot to know just you know even just responding on twitter or on you know when i post the the podcast to youtube just a good job or even like you're a piece of shit lets me know that you listened and if you want to hate listen fuck i'll take it man um, cause I feel like this is kind of an art outlet for me, like talking to people and helping people and, you know, educating people about my experience with cryptocurrency so they don't make the same mistake. Um, so every little bit helps. So help your fellow artists. All right. Thanks everybody.